Hey guys. Um, I think this one will be a little less feisty than the last panel, but that's uh, maybe a good way to end the evening. So, um, yeah, so this panel is a little bit more about, um, you know, security practices. So a little broader than what we've been talking before about tooling or auditing specifically. Um, and so here we have kind of a wide range of people across the security spectrum. So I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves and then I have some kind of intro questions and then hopefully we can start some fights or something and then get some, get some entertainment going. So I'll let you go Let's first. Do it. Definitely in for the fights. <laughs> yeah. um, hey, my name is Alex. Um, nice to be here. Great venue, by the way. So really enjoy the venue. Um, yeah, I'm with Chainsafe. Chainsafe is a blockchain R&D company focused on infrastructure and development tooling. So we have basically three areas of business, which on one hand um, client implementations. So we maintain, for example, the load cell implementation for Ethereum 2 pen sensors and also for 3GS, for example. Um, then we have a second area where we have um, professional services, basically. Um, for example, also a top-notch auditing team. So if you have auditing requirements or requests, come to us. And um, yeah, the third area is the area where I am active in, that's basically products, and at the moment we focus mainly on uh, gaming and interoperability in this space. So uh, we provide on the one hand Web3 Unity, which is an SDK to integrate blockchain um, into Unity-based games, and on the other hand we uh, just launched Sigma, an interoperability protocol, and are about to go to mainnet in some weeks, hopefully. And um, yeah, this basically bridge question of interoperability. Um, myself, I'm in product, so basically, basically leading the product department, uh, but also have an InfoSec background, so I've been in the InfoSec industry, um, I think, for 10 years, or at least 7 years, and um, yeah, just a disclaimer, I will probably be the um, not pro tool guy here, because uh, yeah, in my experience, like, security is a, is a lot, and it's very broad, and um, tools and like um, of course are important but um, are only yeah half of the equation basically. Probably how important is security for chain safe across that whole spectrum and then also how are you guys incorporating security practices and security learnings into your product offerings across all those different layers basically? Okay, yeah, maybe I start a little bit with them, um, like when, when there's a lot of offering on the website, you um, yeah, might not grasp um, uh, instantly what, what we are about. So basically, I think generally you can definitely say the mission is around infrastructure and developer tooling, so this is what unites us and unites all the offerings that we have. And also it's about multi-chain and the cross-chain future. So that's why we are active in more than one ecosystem. We, are, we love Ethereum and we, are, we do a lot there, but it's also not the only ecosystem that we play in. Um, but that much we are very much focused on yeah, developer adoption and on um, yeah, improving blockchain, blockchain infrastructure in general. Yeah, when it comes to, to security, we offer services as well, as you know, like um, auditing services. But this is just one part of, of, of the offering that we have. Uh, I kind of want to pause there, and you, you said something that kind of piqued my interest, developer adoption, and maybe we just get quick, like, what do you guys think? Is security important for developer adoption? Is that something that you've that you've seen, like is, is the security tooling that's available for a particular ecosystem, I guess you guys are mostly working in kind of Ethereum ecosystems while you're on L2, but is, is that something that you see being a concern that developers are having? Um, yeah, I think it works both ways. It works on every layer. So on the developer experience as well, on the end user experience, and only when I'm, as a developer, able to craft secure experiences, I can also translate this to the end user side and have at the end a secure wallet or whatever. I think definitely that um, when you ask me, I'm, I'm in product, so I see security as, at the moment, as through two lenses, basically, and one lens is um, really like that your products have to be secure, and for that I need secure development, I need some tooling to make sure that the code is secure, but I need also a lot of processes and tools around that and, and roles to ensure basically security. But I think the second lens that I see there is um, maybe even more important, and this is this um, adoption lens, I would call it, because um, when I look at the general adoption of Web3 or blockchain technologies, I think um, um, security is one of the main obstacles that we have still besides UX, so it's still one of the biggest blockers that uh, yeah, uh, basically yeah, makes a lot of people not move into the space. I mean, we have only crypto natives in a lot of situations because they are willing to deal with the, with the clunkiness and with the security risks involved. But I think um, yeah, this experience is, is important because it only can work when it's um, 
when it's basically working across all layers. I cannot build a really secure end-user experience when I do not have this on my on the developer experience level. That's so you're saying that it's not only important for developer adoption, but also just user adoption at that point? Yes, but the, the, it's mandatory to have it on the developer level first to achieve also the end-user level. Yeah. yeah, for security experience, um, honestly, the tooling right now is very underwhelming. So there's definitely more work that needs to happen and that needs to happen in that direction. And more than the tooling, I would say just the educational content and knowledge base out there regards to like in context to blockchain security is very, very, very lacking. So that's one thing at least I'm focusing on from Polygon's perspective. Uh, I am working on pushing out more security content so that like new people who are coming in who don't know what they need to do can just go through those blog posts, those knowledge bases those checklists and figure out, hey, this is something I need to focus on, this is something I need to focus on, and then they can go deeper into every topic. So even just something basic like that is missing in this space, which leads to developers either not caring about security at all, which in turn leads to more exploits and hacks and everything, or it leads to a very frustrating or bad developer experience that they understand they need to focus on security, but for them to actually learn what they need to focus on, it takes much, much, much longer than it uh, needs to. So definitely it's a big hurdle for developer UX and just the space in general. Uh, everyone, I think, needs to work together to fix it. Tooling needs to get better. There needs to be more content uh, pushed out. Um, yeah, if the question is, does security help with developer adoption? I think, I think it matters very little, honestly. I think maybe Viper is a more secure language than Solidity, arguably. I think JavaScript probably isn't the most secure Web2 language. So when it comes to developer adoption, I think it's about critical mass of developers and then also where users are. Critical mass of developers is like where the library is being built that you can easily kind of use. And then if no one on the user side ends up using the products built by that language, then developers will also go away. So I think sadly, security does not matter that much for developer adoption. I, I think I would almost second your point there. I, I think the reason we have so much more security tooling for Ethereum is just because it's an older ecosystem and there's been more people drawn to it and so more people are caring. But like, I, even even me who's like working in the security field, I'm, you know, when I'm investing small amounts, I'm pretty deep, like in terms of user, I'm pretty degen about it. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not going through and checking all the security check. I mean, obviously I'm like being a little bit careful, but I feel like at least for me, it's not super important, the security for investment, but obviously I, I get wrecked and care a lot about that, but. Anyway. Yeah, that's what I feel like when a lot of situations happen, still a lot of people are drawn away by that, uh, for sure. Yeah, maybe it pushes people out of the ecosystem more than draws them in, like the lack of security is pushing people out. Yeah, and I've definitely seen um, developers that were afraid of being not able to ensure the, the security of the app they built. You know, that I have kind of friends that say like, hey, I want to build a DeFi protocol, but you know, I, I do not want to really, I'm, I'm not sure if I can handle the security implications of that. So I would definitely, I think I have a true point, and I'm, uh, I was in the InfoSec industry for a while, and I definitely um, um, understand like what you're saying in terms of Security doesn't matter as much as we would love that it matters, but um, yeah, on the other point, that that's definitely also concerned people. My point is like, for sure, in terms of just raw numbers, security won't affect those numbers. New developers will still coming in, but the thing is, as I said, they'll choose the path where they just don't learn security. And for me, those are not the developers I want to hire. I want to hire the people who actually struggle, uh, no matter how bad the UX is, or DevXs and actually learn those security basics. I want those developers to be building my products. And it is a big hurdle for, uh, for those developers uh, coming in. So uh, that kind of segues nicely into my next question for you, Madhu. Um, you know, you're, you're working at Polygon, you're looking to develop a bunch of new stuff, and I hear you're like working on building out your own in-house security, basically. So what are your thoughts about this in-house security versus hiring it out to security audit firms and also how do you plan to structure that like are you you know is it going to be that the solidity devs you're hiring just also have a security mindset or is it more you're looking to have separate teams or you know what's what's your thoughts about that process so 
I can give you more details into what I am doing at Polygon. So, first of all, the security team is different from the developer team, but I have a champion assigned in the developer team who uh, leads or like who promotes security. Uh, we have uh, educational sessions around security every now and then. Uh, internal or external? Internal. So, uh, yeah, right now those are internal, but I'm actually planning on making or recording those for external users as well. We'll have to obviously, like, maybe censor some stuff and some questions and stuff like that. But, yeah, that's one thing I'll do. Uh, plus, every developer that joins Polygon's development team has to go through this uh, documentation or sort of training that we have built from the security team just so that we know that they are focusing on at least the basics. Uh, we ensure that they have a basic security mindset. It's, uh, and honestly, when you are in a team, it is really about the environment of that team. If everyone else is uh, careful about security, the newcomer is just automatically, they automatically become careful, start following that. So we have set up that ecosystem, that environment in our team, that security is priority uh, for the developers. Then on the security team itself, the way I have uh, done it is I have uh, about 10 people in my team right now hiring more. Uh, for every project that Polygon is building, I try to assign one dedicated security point of contact that keeps in touch with them continuously. Uh, they go to their stand-ups, they keep following the progress, they review their architecture, they, they basically work with the developer team from day zero, from the research team from day zero to make sure what is being planned uh, to be built can be built securely. Uh, what audit firms uh, tend to do is they come in at the end of the development cycle when the process, like when you already have the code finalized and so on. And at that point you are in a very tricky situation that hey, the audit firm thinks, hey, you did this, we can't break this, we have not found an uh, exploit yet, but we are not we are not confident in this code base, uh, like it's very complex or it has this potential issue or whatnot. It happens very often in complex code bases. And then now you have to figure out like, do you just roll the dice, dice launch it or rework the whole thing and stuff like that. And oftentimes in practical sense, projects will just roll the dice and launch it and say, hey, like, here's our audit report. So the auditor says they didn't find anything doesn't matter that there's an addendum that says they don't have confidence in it. Nobody goes to that area. So uh, what if people, if people even read the section that says they didn't find anything. Yeah, exactly. So what I'm doing at Polygon is having security people from day zero. So we never get to a situation where the whole project has been built, all of the resources have been spent, and now the security team is saying, hey, we don't have confidence in it. So I want to build what we can secure, uh, obviously nothing is 100% secure, but we want to build what we can have confidence in uh, from a security point of view. Yeah, I think this cultural aspect is, is really important to not make like security something that is intrinsically hard to do from my perspective because it goes through everything, you know, and uh, especially on a team you have to set this mindset from day one that security is important when you do code reviews or whatever, you have to put an emphasis also on security and educating junior developers about it and all of this. Um, yeah, that's definitely very important. Uh, do you have anything on that? Um, no, I think, I think those are good points. And it's, it's sometimes a matter of feasibility if a team can hire in-house security experts or not. Um, any team that's starting up isn't going to be able to hire anyone who's in the top 50 in security in the world. And by the way, you need people to do security, so you really have to get somebody who is top in the world. Um, and it can be helpful to get someone who's not in that uh, echelon, but they can only get you so far, and then you're going to need to do some kind of audit or some kind of security review where those top people in the world are looking at your code. Yeah, I think what is important about how I, how I see that both of your points are, are valid in that sense, you know, so that's important to have this culture, but um, and it's important as well to have audits done by, by very professional experts, you know, but not that you can, I think that's what, what Manu was uh, alluding to is that you cannot treat the audit as a kind of, um, yeah, as an excuse to not um, have a security mindset yourself. Um, yeah, so I kind of want to ask, from the perspective of you, Jack, and you, Alex, because you're probably seeing a lot more projects come across your company's desks in, you know, from external projects come across your company's desks. Are you seeing a trend in terms of people hiring their own internal security experts? Or are they still kind of outsourcing that fully 
on their own, on development teams. And maybe that's maybe it's a different answer for you know small versus large or you know old versus new teams. Um, yeah, I think it really it really depends on the size of the team. Probably ninety percent of teams that we work with don't have an internal security expert or security team. Uh, maybe more than ninety percent, and so you know they're they're really focused on getting audits. That's kind of like the thing that they need to do before they go to mainnet in their minds, um, and. The thing, the main thing they have to do before they do the audit is really like unit testing. That's kind of like the one thing you can actually get them to um, to do before the audit starts. Anything in terms of having them do fuzzing or, or some kind of security tool, um, it's it's really hard to ask that of them. So I would say we're seeing most projects. We work with early stage projects mostly, and they do not have security teams. They don't have security experts, um, and so they're really focused on getting unit tests done for their protocol, and then getting it to an auditor. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I don't have limited visibility in that, but what I can tell is definitely that um, yeah, most teams are still relying heavily on uh, audits, and I also think uh, that will not change and will always be an important part of the security strategy. You know, and I'm yeah, also excited to see the development of, of how audits from technology and process pers perspective, how they change and how they evolve. I thought I can add a little. So, uh, you're right, like the smaller teams, they are not hiring for security people. They don't have the budget for it really, uh, which is fine. Most of the bigger teams in the ecosystem now are actually, either they already have a security team or, a, or are hiring for one. So Polygon was one of the first who like kick-started this movement and I've been telling everyone I know like in the ecosystem, hey, you need a security person, get someone. Aave has an open position for CISO. Uh, Lido has an open position. Optimism is hiring head of security, so uh, yeah, really, all big orgs are hiring security people right now. If you want to join any one of those orgs, it's a good time to apply. Okay. Any other thoughts, guys? I, I think I agree mostly with what you guys are saying. Most of the small, the small teams that we're seeing come across don't have their own in-house security. But what we do see is the more times we work with the same team or if we've had a team that comes after having worked with another firm and comes to us, the, the quality of their code is increasing over time, so they are developing that security-oriented mindset, especially if they're working with an audit firm that's continuously actually talking to them and not just like disappearing in a cave and coming back with a report or something like that. So yeah, and it's also can be handled uh, gradation uh, like a gradient, you know, that you kind of start and there's at one point in the team somebody taking security responsibilities before you actually start then hiring dedicated security people. Stuff. I think it starts with like defining it as a responsibility and having somebody in the team maybe having a look for it, you know, and then yeah, going for dedicated people. Okay, I want to change topics a little bit and ask you a question here, Jack. So the first time I met you and the first time I heard about anyone trying insurance and about Sherlock was at LizCon, um, what, almost a year ago? Or, a year ago. Yeah, about a year ago. And at the time you were, you know, it, it seemed really scary to me, like the idea of offering insurance to to DeFi protocols, but now it seems like it's kind of the norm, and it also seems like you know the, the business model you told me at the time is different than what is it, you know it's evolved since then. So can you tell us about how that evolution has happened and why and the market conditions that triggered that evolution of your guys' business? Yeah, definitely. So I think the reason that we focus on smart contract insurance, we call it smart contract coverage because it's not legally insurance in some jurisdictions. Um, the, re the reason that we focused on smart contract coverage is basically what we get excited about in crypto is allowing people to have property rights when their governments don't necessarily want them to have property rights. Um, that's like one of the fundamental things of hopefully why a lot of us are here and what's exciting about crypto is being able to kind of do things in an uncensorable way just in case your government or another person's government um, doesn't want them to have those rights anymore, so making those rights more fundamental. And if you want to have sort of on-chain property rights and move that away from sort of third parties that are controlled by governments, then you really need to make sure that those on-chain property rights are secure. And for DeFi, it's basically people's life savings that we're talking about here. And so they need to be basically 100% secure or sure that their funds are secure and they're not gonna lose their life savings because that is not an acceptable outcome for them. So you've got that on the user side of crypto, you need to be able to almost 100% guarantee that somebody can keep their life savings in crypto and not lose it. And then you've got the security reality, which is you cannot prove that a single smart contract is 100% safe. 
And those are like directly conflicting with each other. You need the users to be able to feel that, they're, that it's secure, but you can never guarantee that it's secure. And the way to bridge that gap is really with insurance or smart contract coverage. So we think that's gonna be kind of a mainstay of crypto forever for a very long time because of those two kind of elements that will always be conflicting with each other. Um, so that's why we're building smart contract insurance. That's why we got into it. And then on the audit side, we had always wanted to make sure that we could underwrite protocols properly. Insurance is easy if you have 100 years worth of data to look at, but with DeFi, you've got like two years worth of data and it's evolving and there's different reasons for every hack and all of that. So you can't use normal actuarial science on it. And so with Sherlock, we always wanted to go as deep as we could in making sure that the protocols we cover were as safe as possible. Um, and we started out with trying to you know, have different audit firms kind of come in and do that for us and then we would underwrite it. Um, but we kind of lost confidence over the last year in some of the audit firms that we were working with and decided that it would be more, we would feel better if we actually did the audits ourselves. And that's why we launched a new audit model about six weeks ago that includes audit contests. Happy to talk more about that. Um, but that was kind of the evolution for Sherlock was we want to do the insurance because people need to know that their life savings aren't going to go away because of a hack. And if you want to do insurance well, you have to do the underwriting well, which means you have to be really confident in the smart contracts you're underwriting. And so that's why we're doing the audit piece too. Yeah, what I like about this approach specifically is kind of um, also for us as maybe a project or product that would, that would utilize the service is also that you are then skin in the game to some extent, you know, and that changes to some extent. Um, I think also the, the requirement for a lot of folks to kind of find an auditor, you know, and it's, it's hard, you know, because it's, there's no defined criteria. How do I find the right auditor for my project, you know? Well, how do I look for the reputation, you know, the word of mouth? Do I look at, did they audit already the kind of category of application that I'm building for, or did they kind of work with the technologies that I have? So it's really hard, I think, to, uh, to decide for, for an auditor and, and, and decide for, for such a relationship because it's very much based on trust. To a large extent, and I think this insurance component this gives a little bit, um, yeah, more insure and more, yeah, yeah, more credibility on, on this trust side of things. You know. uh, can you talk a little bit more about how your guys' approach to audits has evolved over time? Because, you know, you, the, to me, it seems like this demand for smart contract coverage is really it's demanding that audits scale, right? Like it's it, if you want to be able to underwrite more and more contracts, like audits have to scale at that point. So how are you guys approaching that? Um, yeah. So on the on the scalability of audits, it's a great question. I mean, it's something that I think everyone in the security space struggles with because of the fact that you need someone in that top 50 in the world or whatever it is to be looking at your contract. Because if you're not, then that person or someone in the top 50 is just going to hack your contracts. Uh, or put a bug bounty, you know, if I, uh, do a bug bounty. So that, by definition, doesn't really scale. Um, and so we've been trying to figure that out. I think, you know, we've moved more towards an audit contest model where anyone in the world can come in and submit a bug and the promotions are based on objective criteria of how people perform in different contests. And that wasn't really um, to make audits more scalable, it was to figure out who the top 50 in the world are and make sure that, you know, if that is changing over time, if certain people are becoming really good and all of a sudden your people are not as good, then you're at risk. So you need to be constantly knowing who the best auditors are. Um, and so that was the approach for the, the audit contest model. And it happens that that model becomes fairly scalable. You don't want to stretch it too far because these people only have so much time of the day, but that model becomes very scalable because you have access to way more security experts and you get to understand exactly which ones are good and which ones are not finding things that they maybe should be finding. Yeah, I guess it gives you a way to kind of measure the efficacy of different security experts almost. Um, okay, so I have a follow-up question. Do you think about, um, because what I, I like this approach very much, um, do you think about kind of um, collaborating with other companies in the space as well in that sense to make this, as I said, like this objective criteria, maybe it could be something industry-wide, you know, because, um, yeah, when I, think about security and the challenge as such, I think to a large extent it's the challenge is also a little bit bigger than every company can solve on its own, you know, so it's something that um, where we have to collaborate. And um, yeah, I'm one, just wondering if you have already thoughts and kind of maybe bringing this model to a level where basically it can be used by all auditing companies and there's 
I'm kind of thinking about a kind of ranking that is really like objective and not like tied to a specific auditor, you know, that you can really yeah, basically independently look at the quality of, 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 of this talent and you can then share the, the, the resource pool, basically. Yeah, no, I, I think that's something that's super important and it's very controversial for how the current audit landscape is. Um, but we do work with small audit teams right now. We work with Gimelsec, Watchpug, Arbitrary Execution. They've all done um, really great audits and they're willing to see how they, you know, where they show up on the leaderboard. And that's something that not every audit firm or not every uh, auditor is going to be willing to do, I assume. But, you know, we want to be working with the ones that are willing to do that and are willing to show that they really are the best. Um, and that means competing head to head against other auditors, looking at the same code over the same period of time. Okay, yeah, I also think like that um, this kind of more crowdsourced model basically, you know, will, will, also, will be an, yeah, at least my understanding is an addition to the existing model of, 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 and I know, um, of like having dedicated auditors for very specific for, for a certain task. And maybe only midterm might be able to completely replace that, you know, but I think. Yeah, for the foreseeable time, I guess we will stick with the kind of at least dual approach. That's at least what we do. We think definitely we have um, go both with internal audits with our own auditor team, then we go for an external audit as well with like experts where we know they have audited code like that and where we know they have the skills to do that. And then we just still think about adding such a crowdsourced approach as well because we think it has adds some yeah, it's adds some adds some benefits that um, you do not have by the other approaches. Yeah, the crowdsourced approach has a, a great track record, basically a perfect track record if you're looking at black hat exploits. Um, so that's really impressive, but there are limitations to it. Like you don't know that people are gonna show up on a certain week, so it's really important to do the more traditional auditing process of having people that are dedicated to that code base um, for a certain amount of time. The audit contest, they don't really have a fixed view, you know, there's no one following up to make sure that um, the, the fixes are safe. So. I think a combination of kind of the more traditional approach that we're all familiar with and the audit contest approach can really bring a, a, a high amount of security to a lot of projects. Um, so kind of a broad question for everyone here, uh, although I think Udeep, you're sitting in kind of a different position than the other two here, so we'll have to rephrase it for you. But uh, you know, the, when, you, when you get a new project and you're looking at it and deciding you know, whether you feel good about it or not, just like, you know, first 10 minute impression or first 30 minute impression, what are you looking for? Like, are you, I'm thinking here like, you know, unit tests, simulations, you know, what sort of tooling things are you looking for? Or what sort of, you know, did they get an audit? Are you looking at that? You know, what, how do you make that first 30 minute impression of a project that you first see? I can add on that. So for me, few things stand out. One is their code style which includes uh, code commenting, their variable names, the like indentation they are doing and everything. Just looking at the code will tell you how senior a developer is. So um, that's one thing. And the other is uh, after code you move to unit tests and uh, just a brief look at unit tests will tell you how serious they are about security. Everyone really, almost everyone does happy part test. So, uh, for ERC20 transfer, they'll say like, if Alice sends Bob 20 tokens, Bob should get 20 tokens. But are they checking that Bob can't just use Alice's account to send himself 20 tokens? Are they checking that um, if Alice sends 20 token, uh, somehow she doesn't lose 20 and just transfers 20 and does a double spend or something like that? So negative cases in tests are super important, which uh, only really people who care about security look at. So these are for me the two biggest uh, factors. Yeah, I think um, kind of a lot of the things that you mentioned and, and Mood had mentioned, code commenting, if they're using NatSpec, if they have a lot of code comments to the amount of actual code they have, that's great. Unit tests, you know, the, the more thorough those are, the better. If they've done an audit beforehand, that's great as well. Um, what else? You know, some of the stuff, like if they do their own fuzzing, some of it is really a, a negotiation of like what's realistic to expect from protocol um, versus what is something you absolutely have to have. And I think we've, we're moving in a good direction where unit tests are closer to something you absolutely have to have. Um, having it fuzzed or having you know, an auditor do work on it beforehand or, or um, consult with you beforehand, that's not quite as um, necessary. But yeah, so we require every protocol we work with to have a greater than 80% code to, or sorry, comment to code ratio and a greater than 80% um, unit test 
to like unit test coverage ratio. Um, and those are kind of like the bare minimum that you need. Obviously, we'd love to see 100% unit test coverage. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the answer. Yeah, I would just add one thing is like looking for if there's documentation or best practices available in terms of this is what we think is typical things you should avoid, you know, in terms of security, I think, yeah, this also helps to just a little bit about the maturity of, of the organization. That's what, what I would look for as well. Yeah, I, I guess the one thing I would add, which is kind of alluded to with the commenting here, but just like, do you have a, a semi-rigorous specification or something? Like even just having that specification seems to mean that you're you know, thinking about it from a design perspective a lot better. Um, I guess much more specifically for you, Jack, when you guys are deciding whether to underwrite a new protocol, like, are you able to tell us exactly the list of things you look at? Like, for example, you just mentioned like, oh yeah, you don't really care if they got a prior audit or something like that. So do you just not even consider that in the premiums you set? Or is it, uh, you know, what, what's kind of the formula there in terms of the premiums you set? Yeah, it's, it's an evolving process. We've moved to making the premiums much more kind of stable so that it's very easy for people, for users, protocol teams to know what they're going to get afterwards. And so we just have a list of requirements that they have to do before the audit. A big one is the amount of code in the actual code base. If it's above, you know, 5,000 solidity lines of code, it becomes really difficult for anyone to feel good about the, the security of it. And then, like we said before, the code com commenting and aspect, the, uh, the unit tests um, are really important. And having an audit beforehand is great, but it's not something we can really rely on because it's, you know, the variability in audits is quite high, as you probably know. There are really great audit firms out there, and there are audit firms that are um, on the scammier side, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we're looking deeply into things like formal verification and how that can lower premiums because that is something that clearly um, marks that a protocol has taken their security more seriously and the risk of exploit is almost certainly lower if they've done formal verification. So I think we're working to get those kind of things implemented as well in the pricing. So it sounds like you're kind of leaning towards the almost in-house security, like when you're taking a new protocol and you're not necessarily going to trust their claims about their security or their auditor's claims about their security, you're going to go and check that or you're going to hire an auditor via this crowdsource thing to check that for you rather than delegating that to the audit firm that brought the project to you or something like that. Yeah, exactly. So I should have been clear that there's a requirements checklist that every protocol has to have before they can even do a Sherlock audit. And then the Sherlock audit is required for coverage. So we go through and do our entire process to make sure that we feel good about the code base during that audit. What do you guys think about this in-house versus delegate, delegated security approach? I know you're, you're leaning more towards the in-house side, but are you going to delegate any still or? Uh, we are. So like, it's about a mix. Uh, I think like neither, if you pick just one of those two, that's not ideal approach. So um, ideally you really want someone in-house uh, working from start to finish and then external people coming in with a fresh point of view, fresh mind who don't have any prior context uh, and stuff like that and just uh, looking or digging into the code base from an adversarial mindset. Uh, so they won't have any prior uh, biases in the code base or anything like that and would simulate more uh, of what an attacker would uh, think like. So yeah, like we are working with almost half a dozen auditors right now, uh, talking to a bunch more and we'll continue working both with internal teams and external teams. Yeah, that's also what we always would recommend if you have an internal team to still have an external audit as well because of the bias reduction and stuff. And this is also like we handle that. We have a great internal audit team, but um, we would still go for an external audit as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the answer, the cop-out answer is that both is the best way to go because if you don't have the internal team, then you're building a code base that could have been much more optimized for security that entire time. And if you don't have the external people, then you really have to hope that you hire literally the best people in the world on your internal security team who didn't miss anything. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I feel like at a security event, we're kind of in an echo chamber where it's just like, yes, more, you have to do more, 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 you should do this more. Um, so we probably need to put some kind of constraint on that in terms of like, there's a, there's a limit, you're, you're approaching a limit of like 100% secure, but you're never hitting that limit. So like, what are the things that are really material that push you from like 97% secure to 99.9? .9? Um, versus things that are just sort of very incrementally adding security. I kind of want to change 
uh, topics a little bit here and talk about education of developers regarding security and building that secure that you know security mindset culture that we were discussing earlier have you guys noticed any particular practices that seem to develop that culture faster in development teams for like I just I know it's kind of a vague question but for us you know we have some repeat customers coming to us for audits and we're kind of educating them about how they can go about improving their security themselves and we do notice that their code quality coming to us the second or the third time is improving and we have a few specific things we do to educate them about that. That improves that. Do you guys have any suggestions or ideas about how to quickly get people to improve their own security? Yeah, I would. Um, I would definitely opt for kind of sharing, just sharing knowledge and co collaborating. I like what uh, Madip was saying in terms of bring more content to people in terms of how you handle security within Polygon and stuff like that. We have the same approach. You know, for example, we bring our interoperability protocol to mainnet soon, and we have just launch blog articles about how do we handle security, what is the specific steps that we are taking, and all of that. And we also publish audit reports and stuff like this. So I think usually from a developer's perspective, um, it's great to learn from others in this space that had the same problems as you have, and to see how they handled them, you know, and that's why I can only strongly advocate for, for sharing more knowledge and, and being more intentional about doing that and not like treating it as security by obscurity and basically just saying like, oh, as long as I don't tell anybody, nobody will find out. No. Yeah, I think kind of to Everett's point, it's really about the teams that have a healthy respect for how difficult security is. And a lot of those teams happen to be teams that have been through an audit process before and have experienced that because a lot of first time teams, and Sherlock was guilty of this ourselves, you know, you build an entire protocol and you know every line of code and you've unit tested it and you're like, okay, this, the audit is just going to be this like quick stamp because there's obviously no vulnerabilities in this protocol that I've built. That's my baby. Um, and that's a lot of first time teams attitudes. And then they go through the first audit and they're like, oh my God, we would have been hacked in these five different ways. Um, and so that unfortunately seems to be the only forcing function for teams to have a healthy respect for security. There are some that are first time that have that healthy respect, which is amazing, but I don't know how to teach that. It's all about the security culture in the team. Um, so the best way to get security culture is to get people excited about security. The way we are doing it at Polygon is uh, we got one person excited, we made them the champion, and now they are making everyone else excited. So with security culture and all of this, it really is it really depends on your peers. If you, as a new developer, if you go in a team where everyone really cares about security, you automatically start caring about it and start spending more time on it. Your brain just says, hey, this is something super important. But if the opposite happens, if even if you are a very security-minded person and you start working for a company or a team that does not really care about security, maybe you'll push them for two weeks, three weeks, and then just give up. You'll be like, if nobody cares, why should I care? So security culture is the most important things, uh, most important thing, and the best way to get security culture is to get people actually excited about security. Tell them what security can bring in. Show them how excited it is, how exciting it is. Make it fun. Uh, do some exercises. Do some lectures, training exercises, and stuff like that. But it's really hard to defend. I think, especially when you're at, I totally like what you're saying. We are all are in this echo chamber here, and basically, well, no security is important. But it's so hard to defend. You know, when you're in a startup and you have time to market, and then, you know, like, hey, those security steps they will they will move us for weeks or six weeks. You know, then it's extremely hard to defend. You know, that's that's really tough, really tough. So I think also what is very important to have a management commitment of that one, because when you don't have that, there's no way to do that. Sure. So on that, just one more, like if you have the security culture, then whatever timelines the developers or whatever propose will always have those security timelines or additional uh, time they have to spend in build. So there just won't be a difference for like go to market. It would just be implicit or inherit that once developing a software, you just have to do this. So uh, yeah, that's part of security culture. It's amazing to me. I think it's very telling that you know we're up here talking about security and we're all saying, yeah, it's just about the people, it's just about the processes, it's just about the culture. It's amazing. Like, and I think you see the same thing in aerospace. Like they're actually using tools to, you know, check that a plane is correct is like a very small portion of the actual checklist that you go through. It's you know, 
did a human go and read this piece of code and check that every entry point had this property? Did a human go and, you know, that's kind of the checklist they go through there. So I think it's, it's kind of telling about how hard it is to automate and define good security practices um, that we're all still basically saying the same thing there. Um, I want to kind of open it up to questions from the audience if there are any, otherwise I have a couple more uh, that I can go through. We've got some really smart people up here, so, you know. Okay, well, raise your hand if you have any. Um, I just have a couple more uh, that we can go through. I think there's a question in the corner. Okay. Yeah, my question is um, to Jack. Um, so, um, you are saying about the uh, audit uh, competition, audit contest, um, like a big words that uh, uh, it will show who is who, uh, but you know, like audit firms are overbooked for like a lot of months. Some audit firms are overbooked for years. How will you incentivize them to participate so to ensure that uh, it's kind of you know complete and everybody was involved and the ranking is fair? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great question. Um, and on the audit contest, you know, obviously it's an opt-in thing. So if people are opting out because they're booked for a few years, uh, a few years out or a few months out, then uh, they won't show up in the rankings and they won't be a part of the system. And that's definitely, you know, potentially a blind spot if you have a bunch of really great audit firms that are booked out super long and they have, you know, most of the top 50 top auditors working at those firms. Um, but I think we've seen at least a few examples that have kind of showed that even some of those, you know, really top firms, um, you know, they miss things too that people from all over the world can come and find. I think the open sea competition on Code Arena was a good example of that where, um, you know, some of the very top audit firms in the world looked at it and then they did a Code Arena audit contest and they found a few more critical vulnerabilities. So, yeah, I think it's, it's, um, you know, a tough balance there, and those people will not be initially in the rankings if they choose not to participate. Yeah, I kind of had a similar question. If you'd seen a different, you know, the people who are participating in the crowdsourced audit, is it mostly newer audit firms, smaller audit firms? Because I, I mean, I know at least we don't participate in them, but similarly to uh, what the folks at Hacken are saying, like, we're just booked out, there's no way we could participate, so. Yeah, uh, I think it's a great question. I think um, the trend is definitely towards auto firms kind of participating in it more. I know Sertora has been a participant in Code Arena for a long time, and we've had some auto firms that were excited about um, participating in Sherlock in the first couple of contests since our launch. Um, so, yeah, I think it'll be uh, you know we'll continue to try to see what the what the right approach is there. And uh, another piece of it will just have to be like, is it economically? Are you economically incentivized to participate in it? Um, and if you're not, then that's a, a problem with the audit contest, and that's something that would need to be figured out most likely. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, we... sorry. One other thing on that: we see a lot of independent auditors who have come from top audit firms um, who want to, I guess, you know, take a bigger cut of their audit earnings or show that they are one of the best at their firm and they weren't getting paid properly or just have more independence in terms of auditing things you know, once every two months or having a different schedule. Some of them have made a good amount of money at this point. Um, so we see a lot of those guys who have kind of broken off from top audit firms and now do audit contests uh, instead. Any other? Oh. Yeah. Hey, um, I guess I have a little bit of an issue with what you just said. Um, you've basically described, you know, people who are coming from a place of being even emotionally disturbed, and you're kind of leveraging that to say, hey, use your anger and all this emotion to come participate in a contest. And similarly, from Hacken, they were talking about, you know, obviously these things, people don't care about it because they don't see that they're getting paid for it and financial motivations, blah, blah, blah. But I think the real problem is that we're not creating standards, we're not collaborating, and we're not working on ways that we can make these things easier. If it is all about financial incentive, then why would someone on your platform not exploit something later down the line? 
and instead show something to the rest of the community. Cash is bad now. Pardon? <laughs> Mr. Negri Cash is bad now. All I'm trying to say, I'm not. You were going to. We want to use Sherlock. We we love what you guys are doing. But I guess my perspective here is I think we need to definitely be honest that having someone trying to prove that they should get paid more than where they were before is definitely not the intention I'm looking for for someone auditing my code. Yeah, um, I think there's some, there's some fair points in there. Um, the, you know, if somebody is going to get paid more working at, you know, through an audit contest than they would at an audit firm, then I think that's their discretion to kind of decide to do audit contests instead of work at an audit firm, and no one is forcing them to do that. I think they look at it from an individual perspective and say that this is the best thing that I can do for myself. Um, so there's that piece of it, and then let me think what else was in there. So you know, there's the, we can also talk about kind of the incentive model of it if if that was a piece of it where you know there is a chance that somebody could look at the code and then decide not to disclose the exploit during the contest and things like that. Um, you know, there's definitely some game theory involved there and that's a decision that somebody could make um, in terms of like, I'm going to try to wait and do a bug bounty for it or do, you know, a black hat exploit instead of submitting it in the, uh, in the contest. But we've, we've kind of seen that that's a, a pretty risky approach to take because most of the bugs that are found are duplicates, meaning multiple people find them. And so if you decide not to submit a bug, then you have to hope that no one else submits it. And if someone else does, then your black hat exploit or your you know, sort of bug bounty on chain isn't going to pay anything. Um, so there's some game theory involved in it as well. And I'm not sure I hit on everything in that question. So if there's more, happy to, to talk about it. You can add a few um, things there, one second, so. Uh, really, with audit contests and this crowdsourcing, one thing really we need to understand is these are very, very different from audits that you get from a traditional company. Um, I would say these crowdsource uh, projects or contests are really closer to a bug bounty program, pre-launch bug bounty than an audit. So the people you see participating here are also uh, the people really intersect, with, uh, intersect more with the bug bounty uh, hunters than the traditional auditors. Uh, these crowdsource projects are not a replacement for audits or uh, bug bounty projects or anything. They are a very good addition uh, to both of these things. So you should like, uh, they are a nice thing to have. You should go for them, but don't think of them as a replacement for traditional audits or uh, bug bounty programs uh, either. And another thing I'll add here is on incentives. That's a separate question in the sense that uh, every individual has different goals. Uh, as companies or whatever, we shouldn't be like promoting one thing or another. We just have to, every department or field has to figure out an incentive model that uh, tries to retain the best talent. Crowdsourced uh, contests have uh, found one model that works. Bug counties are another model. Uh, with traditional auditors, the model is job security plus maybe a, on average a lower pay. But the thing is like uh, job security and peace of mind is also important. Just having a constant stream of money than depending on occasional bug bounties or uh, inconsistent. So that's one thing. Code audit, like these traditional firms can also do more models uh, like profit sharing which I know some audit firms are doing and uh, others are pushing for it because if you don't do audit, uh, if you don't do profit sharing, what ends up happening is in bull cycle, the companies make a lot of money, start increasing their prices and so on. When the auditors see that, they, the top of the top talent might want to leave uh, because like, it is unfair that if the company is making like 20 times more than what they are making on uh, hourly basis uh, for their work. Uh, so that is one thing. In beer cycle, the company doesn't want to increase their wages because in the beer cycle, the prices go down. It keeps, it becomes harder to maintain it. So there, something which is like profit sharing based might help. Well, I just want to make it clear, that's not what I'm talking about. Like how you got in your position is you wrote blog posts, you were a part of the community, you made yourself who you are through good intention and credibility and trust. And now you are in the position you're in. 
Those are the people I want looking at my code. And what I've heard a bunch of times by a bunch of people is how this is all about financial incentives. If it's all about financial incentives, then why am I financially incentivized to not exploit something instead of doing it right? So it goes back to culture, it goes back to community, and actually good intention. So I think we need to be very careful when we conflate these two things in this conversation because it's just not going to lead anywhere good. But I think that there is financial incentive to not black hat, right? Like, because exactly tornado cash is not good anymore. Or, like, you know, what are you going to do with that money? And what are you going to do with the fact that your reputation is drilled into the ground, right? So I think there actually is financial and non-financial incentive to not black hat in that situation. And if I may just add on what you were saying with it, is that it's indeed two very different things to do a bug bounty. It's kind of fun, you look for a bug, and, nah, 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 and once you're bored with it, you just stop. When you do an audit, it's exhaustivity. It's you have to check the whole code and you know the, try to understand the parts that you don't want to understand. And it's it's a very different approach to work than this free freelance life where you seek you know challenge. It's very different. So, yeah. Let, let me just address a few things there. Um, I think on the financial incentives piece, you know, kind of the game theory aspect of audit contests. Is uh, you know I kind of talked about that already. I think that addresses the uh, the financial incentives of those auditors, um, and if they want to try to do a black hat exploit, they're welcome to try to do that. But it's extremely risky in terms of the time they put in for the you know zero dollars they might get paid. Um, and then in terms of audit contests are not a replacement for audits. 100% agree with that. Um, that's why you know audit contests they don't have fixed reviews. They don't have someone who's dedicated to the code base. Um, that's why Sherlock has combined audit contests with traditional audits to make sure that a top expert or two top experts are dedicated to that code base for a certain amount of time. They're also doing the fix review, and so it's combining both of those two things, and that we think makes it the best audit in, in the space, but I know that's a controversial statement in this room. Like well, it's hard to... Yeah. We love what you're I disagree. A little bit. So, like, I think we need to find a middle ground here in the sense that uh, I truly believe financial incentives are not the only thing that matters, but they do matter. So, at the end of the day, we really want to convert black hats into white hats. And uh, obviously, ideally, we would just want everyone to have a clear, conscious mind and do what is right. But we live in a practical world, and the reality is 90% uh, of the throwing a random number, but most of the population right now is not uh, like pure of heart. They won't just do the right thing because it's a good thing. There are a few people who do it, uh, like I reported a critical vulnerability in a $20 million protocol and got paid $250 in bug bounty. Funny story, but I did it because I didn't really care about the money, I wanted it to be fixed. There are still people who will do it uh, for that money, but there are other people in the space who will, uh, for $250, they would say, hey, no, I'm gonna exploit it. If you pay me 250 k then sure, you can have the issue fixed and I'll report it. Um, so there are a large chunk of people who have a price, really, that for this amount of money, they are willing to do the right thing. For anything less, they won't do it. And from a pra practical perspective, from the other side, uh, I'm not gonna go there and say like, hey, I just want the good people to be looking at my code base. Anything who, anyone who is bad can just exploit it. I would rather say, hey, I want the good people to obviously look at it. I want to pay them a fair uh, price. And I also want to convert maybe not so good people, but that are like, I can buy those people, let's say. I also want to buy a good chunk of those to actually look at my code base. Because at the end of the day, for me, I care about the security of my protocol. I don't really mind who exactly is looking at that. And that's just my opinion. Okay. Uh, we are out, well, we're running out of time, so I want to give you a chance to speak if you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, I think it's at the end not a question about one or the other, you know, so it's like uh, at the end multiple tools that we have available and that uh, help us to increase security of our products, but I definitely think, um, yeah, also the incentivation piece is something that we will have to learn about, you know, how this turns out and we are so early and it's fresh and I think it's definitely worth watching it and not like saying it will definitely be the new gold standard, you know, it's a new tool in the toolbox and we will look how it evolves, I guess. Yeah.
I think it's hard yeah. to argue with the efficacy studies as well, which is why I like what is happening here because you know you're trying new things and you're measuring the effect of it and just seeing is this working, right? And so I think that's really what's important here is just actually measuring is this working somehow, you know, trying to come up with some metrics and then quantifying it and in keeping on using the methods that are working. So yeah, I just want to kind of say I think there's a great place for audit contests in the future of you know, blockchain security, I think the traditional audit model, there's also a great place for that. Form of verification, that's a really important piece as well. None of that's going away. Um, and also on the financial incentives, I think that there are many more incentives beyond financial incentives out there. I think none of us on this stage would have taken the path that we took if we were just financially motivated. Um, so yeah, I do agree that there are, other, there are other incentives and we want to acknowledge and make those um, come to the forefront more as well. Okay, we are definitely out of time now. I want to give you guys a chance to shill whatever it is that you're doing at DevCon, so please. Uh, yeah, we have definitely two sessions coming up. I do not have the schedule in mind, uh, but there will be one session by the Lodestar team, our um, Ethereum 2 consensus client, um, around matrix-driven development. Aiden, do you know when it is? Okay. Jack? Um, well, we don't have anything to shill at DevCon. Uh, just come talk to Jack. I'm going to be in the audience. <laughs> yeah, for us, Polygon has a bunch of things. Literally, we had uh, it's still going on. Polygon Connect uh, flagship event. We announced our zk VM testnet today. Uh, it's live now. It's reality. You can go around, play with it. Aave is deployed on it. Lens is deployed on it. A bunch of other major things are there already. Uh, with DevCon specifically, we have a bunch of great talks about uh, zk VM and uh, like ZK rollups in general. I think we have seven, I might, I don't remember the exact number, but we have a bunch of those. Plus, uh, with on like my personal thing, I have a panel tomorrow with uh, like a bunch of great minds, uh, Sam Caesar and Taylor from uh, my crypto Coinbase folks and stuff, uh, where we'll be discussing Web2 security versus Web3 security. Uh, that should be a fun talk, definitely come there if you have time. Yes, I have to read it unfortunately. So yeah, first talk by okay, Afri um, around um, post-merge testnets on Ethereum will be tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. in, um, in a room called Forests. Second one will be uh, Georges, not here anymore, uh, talking about um, how bridges improve layer 2 com composability. Also tomorrow at 4.50 p.m. Uh, in Room River. And then we have a side, net, a side event that we host together with Argent at Starknet. Um, it's also tomorrow, I guess. Um, you can register and just find it online. Okay, cool. It sounds like there's some cool ZK stuff going on with several people. So, okay, thank you guys. Really appreciate it, and thank you. Very much.